Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Okay, welcome back everyone. You are watching theCUBE live here in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV. This is our, our second event in Silicon Valley, the fourth overall. We had two events in Big Data, New York City, NYC, Big Data NYC, and now Big Data SV. We go out to the events, we start to see from the noise, have our own event in conjunction with Strata Conference and Hadoop World going on this week. Of course, we're bringing all the CUBE uh, magic to you, all the data, extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Kelly. Our next guest is the esteemed Bill Schmarzo, uh, author of the Big Data Bible, we're calling it, uh, but uh, um, a friend, CUBE alumni, congratulations on your success with your book. Thank you, um, thank you. And of course, I wrote the inside cover quota. But That's you know, why it's but popular, <laughs> otherwise it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a winner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but seriously, you wrote this book, book on the plane, on a whim, and um, it's just taking off. People like this book because you just were like practical advice. Let's talk about the success of the book and just give us an update and some of the anecdotal things you've heard. So the, the, the book has, the book's boring, right? It's a, it's a very pragmatic how-to guide and how to sort of head down the big data path, right? And so it's full of exercises and techniques and the, the kind of things we do on consulting projects that really help somebody get started. In fact, it's actually being used by a couple of universities as a textbook now. Seton Hall is using it, and um, I'm actually teaching a class now at the University of San Francisco called the Big Data NBA, and this is used mm -hmm. as kind of the textbook for that. So when we called you the Dean of Big Data, it was more of a terms of endearment, we love you, you're like, hey, you're the, you're the guru, and we, and we know each other, so it's kind of a fun term, but now you actually are the Dean of Big Data, your <coughs> book is being used in, in, in the university. I think I found a second career, right? When I get, <laughs> I get tired of flying on airplanes all the time, I, maybe I can become a professor somewhere, <laughs> the <laughs> professor, professor of Big Data. Yeah, we'll throw in some speaking gigs too, you know, they got great retainers, yeah. so you know, they just write it in the book. No, seriously, so it's been fun, you have any uh, good experiences so far with customers with this book? Um, yeah, it, it, I, I was in a, uh, and I had a client meeting recently and I walk into the meeting, sit down and the, the CIO walks in and he has his book in his hand and he goes, this book is the Bible. Every organization is reading this book. It is how we're attacking things. And I was like, what book is that? Mm -hmm. oh, it's, oh, it's my book. Oh yeah, very great. And he said, because it's, it lays down in a very pragmatic fashion how to start. And it doesn't start by saying what technology you need to go after because to be honest with you, the minute this book was written and published, on the technology side, it was outdated, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It was outdated. So it, 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 it frames a problem from a business perspective, which gives you the, uh, the guardrails, the guardrails that, that allow the organization to make decisions about what data should I go after? Um, what sort of analytics am I going to need? Um, what's the technology foundation for this thing? And it allows organizations to kind of step at this thing one step at a time as they, as they build out their da big data strategy. Mm -hmm. um, this is the book, Understanding Big Data, published by an amazing job by Wiley, great publisher of books. You got to check it out, Wiley's amazing. Great, great books. Um, and Bill, so, so what's now? I mean, what, what I'm really, first of all, I'm impressed that you got the book done because one, it's one, you travel a lot. Yeah, and yeah. you told the story on theCUBE earlier, uh, a couple of years ago, you just started banging out chapters because you're on a flight and you're just bored. Well, I, I actually did two chapters in sitting in the airport in Kansas City. <laughs> we were like an eight hour <laughs> delay and I was, I'm writing, I was just like, okay, just start cranking <laughs> these things out. All right, so you yeah. sit in airports and in hotel lobbies. I mean, I've seen every airplane movie, right? So what else are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Exactly, you're right. So, so what's going on now? Customers, what's changed now that the book's out there? Obviously it's a great book, people using it as a reference point uh, for a big data journey. What's now chapter two of your journey? What are you up to now? Where are your customers? And what are some of the things you're seeing? So the, the, the book, I think from a um, how-to framework perspective still works. What we're learning is we're learning new techniques. There's um, you know, three exercises we end up developing as part of this class I'm teaching at San Francisco. And um, they're exercises we now incorporate into our approach we do with customers. One of them is around um, uh, how do you do buy analysis, BY analysis, to help uncover new sources of, of data that you may want to go after. And so we're, 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 we're using the, the, you know, the San Francisco as my Petri dish, as, a, as my class there, as a way to tease out. You could do, you could do big data yoga. Yoga. You know, <laughs> yoga and, and take <laughs> these exercises. So like stretch the data, yeah. move the data yeah. around. There you, you go. Know. Mm, have a lot of mm moments. Mm, 
Yeah. Thing. What have you learned? So what have you learning now? What is, what's the big aha for you this time? Because obviously a lot of stuff's going on in the industry. You have the pivotal thing happening with the, this big data uh, platform, uh, open platform alliance, all this stuff happening. What, what's going on with the technology oh, God, and solutions? It, 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 well, from a technology perspective, Hadoop is one. Right. I, it just, you know, no one talks about if Hadoop, it's how I use Hadoop. And, um, you know, something that I mean, we had talked about years ago and from my experience at Yahoo, we, we knew the technology was solid and, and, and too many folks were spending time doing proof of concepts on the technology instead of proof of value on how to get value on the technology. And I tell organizations, don't do a proof of value, a, a proof of concept on Hadoop. I mean, Google, Yahoo, the NSA, they're all using the technology. Trust me, the technology works. The, the challenge organizations have is not with the technology. The, the challenge organizations have is where and how do I start? How do I ensure that I've got organizational buy-in? How do I ensure that I'm focused on area where I can drive a, a, a positive ROI and, and get a, a payback in nine to 12 months? The, the opportunities inside of accounts, we, and to every account we've talked to, the problem is never lack of opportunities, it's always too many. Mm -hmm. And so the part of the process is how do you figure out where to start to build that roadmap so you basically take and knock off one use case at a time and as you're knocking off those use cases, you're building out your analytic foundation, you're building out your intellectual assets, that is, still works, it mm -hmm. still works. And Hadoop is a foundation for that. So how do you get the business involved? Not just from a, you want to find the business use case, but then you got to get the rest of the organization on board and get that buy-in. How do you go about doing that? So we run this thing called a, a, a vision workshop and it's, it's not a one day exercise, it's actually a two week engagement mm -hmm. where we come in and we, we work with the client to figure out what problem they're trying to solve. So we're doing this project for a hospital chain in, in Denver. Their, their key business, prospect, uh, business initiative is around hospital acquired infections, staph infections. Mm -hmm. you know, people come in for some kind of treatment, they get staph infections, they spend more time in the hospital, they, they cost the hospital money, sometimes they even die. So, so how do we reduce hospital acquired infections, right? So if that's a problem we're going after, what we do is we work with the key business stakeholders who are involved with that, we bring them in, and the two things we do with them that just, it's so simple. For the problem they're going after, we want to understand what decisions you're trying to make and what question you're trying to answer in support of that decision. Now the reason why decisions are really important because we're going to actually build analytics around each of the decisions. Not just predictive analytics, but prescriptive. We want to figure out when we talk to them about not only what are you trying to uncover, but what actions are you trying to take right, from the mm -hmm. decisions. And how do we deliver recommendations or prescriptive analytics to help make the human more effective in the process. And so we go through that process, we bring them in early, they realize we're there to support the decision making process, and then we do some, you know, some glitzy things. We build a simple mock-up, you know, mm -hmm. to show them how this might render itself within their mobile app or in their web app or in their mm -hmm. call center, or whatever the right environment might be. And that really helps them to see how they, you know, begin with an end in mind, it really shows them that here's where we're going to go, right? Mm -hmm. Everything we're going to do along the path to get there as far as the decisions, the questions, the data, the analytic models, mm -hmm. the, the technology eventually is going to come in here and they don't care about the technology, but in the end, you're going to get a, you know, a smart app that tells you that when there's a snowstorm, the first snowstorm of the year in Denver, if you get between three to four inches, the number of, the number of um, ER visits increases by 27%. What's interesting, they say, oh yeah, we knew they increased it. We, we knew it increased, right? We didn't know 27%. Now I, need, I know exactly how many more nurses to hire, how many more doctors I have on hand. Mm -hmm. we, it's in some cases, all we're doing is quantifying the hunches that they have. And that's why it's important to bring them in early because mm -hmm. they know that decision they're trying to make mm -hmm. and they have those hunches. We're going to use analytics to either prove or disprove them. Mm -hmm. But no, nowhere in that conversation did the word Hadoop come up. Not once. And mm -hmm. they could give yeah. <laughs> a, a holy hoot about uh, yeah. the technology. Hadoop, Spark, mm -hmm. MapReduce, Yarn. They, they, it's, it's just, it's alphabet soup, soup to them. Mm -hmm. What they care about is how do I make that better decision? Yeah, so we'll talk about how this compares to kind of the more traditional way of doing quote unquote analytics in, in, in the enterprise, which is kind of the data warehouse approach, uh, which is more kind of looking back versus what do I do next? Uh, how does it compare? Is this complementary, do you think, or is this disruptive or some combination of both? It, well, it's complementary in the sense that, you know, BI is about descriptive analytics measuring what happened. Mm -hmm. Big data is about predictive analytics, what is going to happen, and it's about prescriptive analytics, what should I do? And so they, at the high level, they are very complementary. The challenge we have is that most BI organizations think they're doing predictive, right? And yeah, they're building trend lines that show some lines going up and things, but they really aren't figuring out what's going to happen with any level of confidence, and they have no idea how to deliver recommendations. And so, 
the, while at the high level, the data warehouse, the EDW, is not going to go anywhere. It's, it's still very important. You still need to have, you know, end of day, end of week, end of month, those reports come out. On Monday morning when the executives mm -hmm. show up, the dashboards are all updated. Mm -hmm. But it only tells you what happened, how many beds I filled, how many patients I have, how, what my sales were last week, right? The, the, the data science is, is about doing the predictive about what is going to happen. Snowstore comes, you're going to have 27% more. And then the recommendations. You need to bring in two extra nurses, bring in one extra, uh, one extra doctor. By the way, the kinds of, of incidences you're going to have are going to be lacerations and head wounds. You're going to need to follow medication. Get to the prescriptive, get to those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And it sort of it requires, one of the things we find in the process is that IT organizations are really good at thinking better, cheaper, faster, better they're not good at thinking different. Mm -hmm. And for most organizations, it's not the technology gets in the way, it's the mindset of saying, okay, I got the enterprise data warehouse, I'm thinking retrospective what's happening, I need to change my mentality. And some people can't make that switch. Mm -hmm. And is it, it, do you find the, <coughs> the business is more likely to take new approaches? Uh, they're easier to, to talk mm -hmm. to? Uh, and, and think about doing things a different way rather than the IT which might be stuck in a certain way of doing things? I think it's a good point, Jeff. I think it is exactly right. I think the, the business folks are seeing for the first time an opportunity for something going. Well, they're forward. feeling they're the ones feeling the pain. Oh my gosh, yeah, they're the ones who are today. They're getting these you know charts and dashboards and reports, big huge <laughs> reports. And what the heck am I going to do with this? We had we had an <laughs> engagement with a um, a grocery chain, and and we were developing a we created this mock up, and they the, the the store manager of the store we were dealing with had this BI report, you know, green arrow, yellow arrow, red arrow, and she goes, "What the heck am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> right? It doesn't tell me anything I can act on, right?" Mm -hmm. And so. The, the users are frustrated by the, the BI tools telling you that you suck without giving any guidance about how to unsuck. So, Bill, I, gotta, I, wanna, <laughs> I wanna drill down on that because one of the things we hear all the time, first of all, you know, we do hear that Hadoop is a boardroom conversation, that's not Hadoop, or at least what Hadoop will do in terms of solution, that's one thing. But also there's, there's pressure to move fast and change, obviously, you know, it's happening all around us in the industry, open data platforms, one example, much others. But I want to talk about the, the, the customer We've heard from uh, practitioners on theCUBE and also privately, it's like, hey, if someone walks in my door and says, I, I got a platform for you, I'm going to shoot myself. I mean, literally, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and meaning they're like so oversold on platforms, just, hey, buy my platform and your problems are solved. When they just want some tooling and then maybe back into a platform, are you seeing fatigue on the sales side, customers getting bombarded with platform this, platform that, a lot of rip and replace, a lot of promises, not a lot of delivery. So, do you see that, and if you do or don't, talk about that dynamic, what's going on. So John, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I mean, I, I think the, the customers out there are really sick of hearing yet another platform. Um, <clears throat> they don't know what it means, and they don't know how it helps them. Uh, I think we, last time I was on it, we jokingly said, but, but, you know, the, the, it's not the three V's of big data, it's the four M's, right? Make me more money. So they don't understand how the platform helps them make more money, and so they, they, they push back on the vendors, they, um, they and, and we see a lot of product sales flatlining because they're just tired of buying on someone's promise. Um, what's, what's happening, and especially inside of EMC, as, is we're seeing that our go-to-market approach has to change. It has to be focused on our customer success. And I'm not talking about customer success and standing up the stinking technology. I'm talking about customer success and helping to drive their top line. Help them to sell more products, help them to be more effective. Help your here. customers' customers. Help your customers' customers. That's what you mean. Yeah, well in some cases, yeah, and, and here's a good example, we're doing this project for um, a casino, and um, how do we... Hard to write a book in a casino, isn't it? Oh God, yeah it is. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm fortunate all the there. money's going the wrong direction, <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, I know what slot <laughs> machines to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you know, they, they're trying to figure out how they get more interaction, right? So, and yeah, they've got ways to interact with the, with the actual player themselves, you know, how they, what kind of incentives they send them and what kind of comps they give them. But how do you arm all those frontline employees, the ambassadors, the hostesses, the pit boss, the, the, the floor manager, the valet, the, wait, the waitress, the bartender, right? All these people who are touching the players for the day, how do I make them more effective in conveying a better player experience? And so while yes, it is, Ultimately about how do I get the consumer to do more, the player to do more, the patient to be more effective, the teacher to be more effective, the student to be more effective, right? It's how do I basically figure out how to empower the human in between to make them more effective. So I know you come into the, into the casino and I know this is your favorite slot machine. And so I make sure that slot machine's available. 
and you're, I take you right to it. I rush you through checkouts. You're not spending any time in the hotel. I got your drink waiting for you there. Start shoving. Well, you're probably a nickel player, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, no one knew you're probably a big dollar player, but you're shoving your dollars in there. No, I don't do slots. I'm not a slot person. I'm okay. not a big slot but guy. But that's, you know, the idea is how do I, yeah. how does the hostess then get you to your game quicker and ha make sure you have a, a great experience? Mm -hmm. Well, it's about personalizing the experience, and that's what it's all about, whether it's in casinos or any, anything, any, any industry where you're consumer-facing. It's about, you know, people become, come to expect that kind of personalization you get in the, in, in, you know, when you open your Facebook account, and you expect that kind of personalization. Um, this is all about me, and they expect that now in, in, in the real world as well. Yes, they do. I, it's, it's about personalization not only to your customers, but also personalization to your employees. Mm, that's a good so point, you, you too. you've got to think about, the, you know, the single most important person in the grocery business is a store manager. Not the senior vice president of marketing, depending, not no matter what he or she may say. <laughs> it's a store manager who every day is making price decisions and placement decisions and markdown decisions. How do you make them more effective? Mm -hmm. right? How do I make sure that I'm building the right kinds of insights, recommendations that helps them to know that, hey, on this particular day, you know, you're, hey, you're a, you're a mile and a half from Stanford football stadium and they're playing Cal this weekend. You're gonna need to have more beer. And by the way, Stanford fans don't drink Budweiser. And they can't bring beer in Stanford Stadium. I know that because we try to sneak it in. But that's a whole different story, <laughs> We're not as you know. In then, then. Um, <laughs> no, so let's get back. Let's, so let's bring, you bring up this in interesting concept: immersive, immersive experiences in the moment. You see things like Twitter, certainly on the crowd conversations with crowd chat. What we do, you're talking about crossing the street, mobile device, you know, games. You're talking about in the moment, real yep. time, right? So, what are you seeing with real time? Obviously, that's becoming more and more of the value proposition because people are in real time with mobile devices, whether they're things or people. And, and let me let me let me kind of dice the term real time for a second. So what we find is when we, when we look at a business process, a business problem we're going after, we try to decompose that into the data events that occur. And there's almost always in there some data event where timeliness is important. Let me give you an example. Hospital acquired infections. When you check into the hospital, we figure you got between, the, the person at admissions has between four to five minutes to figure out the likelihood of you capturing staph infection, right? We've already pre-built a score that looks at your likelihood, but the nurse also looks for, do you have any open wounds, right? And we're also going to take into account what kind of treatment are you in for? Are you going to need a catheter, right? If those three variables tell us about the probability of you're going to probably capture staph infection, and if your score is too high, we actually can push you to a different part of the hospital, right? To receive more care, you might spend an extra day there, but you're not going to get a staph infection, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, I don't, I'm not making a sub-segment, sub a second-based mm -hmm. decision, right? You're walking in front of a Starbucks, there you are, boom, Schmarzel, here's your favorite drink, come in and get it, right? We got, sometimes the, the, the timeliness might be measured in minutes, maybe even hours, but it's not batch, right? We're trying it's to be near more real time. time. It's near real time, and so the only way that you can really think through how real time it needs to be is to take that business okay. process and decompose so, it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, we've got one minute left. <coughs> I want to ask you a question. I want you to respond to this. Wait, I only got one minute left? No, we'll, we'll go over. We okay. always go over with you. <laughs> I, I got to ask you guys a question. It's technically, you know. I haven't asked you guys a question yet. I got a, I got a right, tough well, question for you. Well, let, ask me a tough question after I get this one right. out there. I want you to react to the following uh, two concepts. Okay. Systems of record and okay. systems of engagement. What's the difference and where's the action? Oh, that's a great question. It's, 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 a, it's the, the, the debate I have a lot of organizations is creating a 360 degree view of the customer, which I think is BS, right? Why, right? Versus creating a profile on a customer where you've quantified all their behaviors. To me, that's a difference, right? I have a system of record, which is my, my, store. my historical 360 degree view of them, but I'm actually more interested in building this system of engagement. What's their, we're working with, uh, with a financial services firm and we're creating a uh, retirement readiness score for all their customers, right? You, it's like a FICA score, yeah. but you take all the other aspects and you create these scores. The hospital chain wants to create a health score and a stress score. The stress score, by the way, is going to feed in Lumosity data so we can help measure what's going on. So to me, it's the difference between 360 degree view of the customer, which is nice but not actionable, but it's important data to have, versus a system of engagement where I'm actually got a bunch of metrics, a bunch of measures, a bunch of scores in place that actually allow me to help me make better decisions. So more real time, more active data? It's Less definitely, yes, it's active. I'm not sure. Again, are they decoupled I, or are they integrated? They're decoupled. Okay. They're decoupled. I, to me, to me you, you're going to feed that system of record data and you're going to gun through it, because okay, you need to have historical perspective. We're just checking, just checking where you're at here. Well, but you, you still know? have to understand yeah. who, that, who that individual is, right? So you have to, you, you don't want to have, if you've got three profiles for the same person, that's not good. You do need to have that 
360 degree view, but then it's about adding in the components around what should I do to engage and these And you people. may not capture everything about that customer. Well, There's maybe things that, yeah. that you don't need to capture. Maybe you don't need the 360 degree view. Right, it's, maybe, it's, maybe 180 is good enough. And it right. depends on, on your business and what the use case is. In some cases, it's like data quality. You don't need 100% data quality for every use case. A, a good point, and, and, and if you don't have the history, I mean, what's real time data without historical perspective? Mm -hmm. That's noise, mm -hmm. right? So you got to have that historical perspective because then you build those profiles. I know, you know, I know what kind of products John buys, and what kind of what kind of food you're interested in, what kind of games you like to play. Right? If I know that historically, and I notice a change in that, that may be something I want to act on. Mm. Right? You get ready to leave. You, uh, you know, you're yeah. going through a life of change event or something like that. I need to I need to have that history so that as the real data comes in, I have something to compare it to. So we we. Um we know you've got your finger on the pulse, as, as always, Dean, and big data. We think, <laughs> I th well, we think, we talked this a lot last night, uh, heavily and all day yesterday, we think um, that uh, Wikibon and the SiliconANGLE team that systems of engagement is, is a holy grail. Yeah. Because undefined, no one has that, it's no, not mature, but it's real time, it's in the moment, it's immersive, it's active. And, and we call those analytic profiles. Yeah, that's We're building analytic profiles on the strategic nouns of their business. And it might be customers, it might be stores, it might be product, and wind yeah. turbines, it might be jet engines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now ask us the question, what do you so, want to do? Which is, yeah, the, no, this, the, is, this is a reversal dean, role here. Dean, so. The dean's going to ask the students, so, the pupils. Um, Big data and, and is all about openness, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Open technology, in many yeah. cases, open business models and open data. Here you are at the, the Strata event run by Riley, who is an advocate at Open, and yet you guys are over here at the Fairmont. <laughs> it seems to be something contrary here that uh, maybe they say open with, out of one side of their mouth, but don't mean it out of the other side of their mouth. Is there a question? Yes. <laughs> is, is there a specific question? <laughs> yes, what is, so what do you think about their definition of open? Um, it's a, I think O'Reilly is a closed organization. I mean, it's a closed mindset, right? A closed is about a walled garden. Yes. AOL was a closed system. Yep. It did great and then died, okay? Walled gardens don't work in the media business. That's proven. O'Reilly is a walled garden and they pretend to be open, but they're really not. And so the Cube has been part of the open community. Amen. We help people. Um, you wrote a book. Uh, it's helped people. We were last night talking to people. Um, there's some big data stuff we heard. People, lives are being saved. Someone was doing this big data project and based on the cube. Uh, was doing saw some suicide prevention technology. Then they that changed some some lives there. We saw people change their business. So we we we're open. So we're open source media. So uh, O'Reilly is closed. We're open, and that's just the way it is. And hey, that's their business model. Um, ours is different. So you know we don't necessarily have any feelings that way. It's just a bad decision on their part as far as we're concerned. Um, but we support that. They're putting out some content. We'll, we'll point to it. In fact, we're relinking a lot of their stuff. The reason why I ask the question is that, is that one of the things I've observed, I'm, I'm observing almost bowling up right now is organizations moving to more open business models. Yeah. Models that allow third parties to make money on their platform. And one of the ways that becomes important is because you think about these, they become marketplaces and you're capturing data about the players, the products, mm -hmm. and you're trying to help match and merge things together. The whole idea of how do I build a model that, yeah. that can, no company can innovate as fast as a market. So you're like, you're like a management consultant as well as a technology leader, which is awesome to, to see customers get that value from your expertise at EMC, and, and I agree. So our philosophy, and talk about the O'Reilly question, it's just a difference of philosophy. Yes. It's like, yeah. they have their business model, they're closed, they'll ultimately you know, go the path of what walled gardens become, highly profitable, and then they milk it and have to reinvent themselves again. But we're seeing this inside out organization where you know, value and community models are all about sharing and collaboration, something called the sharing economy, whatnot, that's what we're part of. Yep. We're part of this new revolution. But Dan Hutchins at CSC was on theCUBE at Oracle Open World, where it's now open because the cube is there. <laughs> um, and uh, they're open, open world. This yeah. now, uh, he pointed out what he's doing at CSC is building an inside out organization meaning they believe that they have to take their inside of their company and make it outside. So for instance, they're doing crowd chats internally, having all hands meetings on crowd chat publicly for the open. So doing things in the open really changes the dynamic. So you're seeing corporations going inside out. You're seeing paradigms like permitless security. Uh, you know, a good friend of theCUBE, Steve Harrod over there at General Atlantic, he's got investments where it's not about the moat anymore in the walled garden, it's about you know, notification economy, sharing economy, inside out seems to be the model. So I, I, would, I would conclude I, that this part of the conversation by saying that there was a quote made um, recently that code trumps cash. I would tell you that business models trump code. That an open business model is the key to success. And, and what's happening is organizations, not only in vendors in the 
big data space, but now corporations are starting to realize that in order to be successful long term, they need to become more open. And big data yeah. plays a very important role because the way to become open is to create this marketplace and provide insights to all the participants that allows them all to be successful. Mm -hmm. Bill, great to have you, and thanks for uh, opening up the, the Pandora's box for on, on, on our openness. And, and uh, you know, we love Tim O'Reilly's been on the Cube many times. Yes. We love O'Reilly, love you. Open for us, content is everything, right? Content is what creates opportunity in the social web. It's about social. Thanks for coming on. As always, being a great friend. This is the Cube. We're live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV in conjunction with Hadoop World and Strata Conference. We are here live in Silicon Valley at the Fairmont. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>